Welcome back everyone, I'm Dr. Rhett Smith for ProtonGuru.com and today we're looking at lesson 7.5. In this lesson we'll talk about NMR spectrometry. Now NMR stands for Nuclear Magnetic Resonance and as this name suggests we're going to be looking at the nuclei in different molecules instead of looking at bond stretching or absorption of UV light to facilitate electronic transitions like we saw with infrared or UV spectroscopy. Now the NMR spectroscopy is a technique that is used to identify compounds and the spectrum itself is a plot of energy on the x-axis just like we saw with the infrared or UV vis spectroscopy versus the intensity. And many common nuclei are what we call NMR active meaning that we can use the nuclear magnetic resonance technique to probe molecules containing these nuclei and you'll run a different spectrum to analyze for each nucleus. So we can run, for example, a proton NMR spectrum, and that spectrum will only see protons. If we run a carbon-13 NMR spectrum, we will only see the carbon-13 nuclei. And notice that the most common isotope of carbon is carbon-12. Carbon-12 can't actually be analyzed by the nuclear magnetic resonance technique, but carbon-13 can and a small abundance of carbon-13 in naturally occurring molecules allows us to look at the carbon nuclei in typical organic molecules. And since most organic molecules have protons and carbons in them, we're going to focus on proton and carbon NMR techniques. But there are many other nuclei that can be explored by nuclear magnetic resonance technique, such as fluorine-19 or phosphorus-31. And one important thing to remember is that if I'm running a proton NMR spectrum, that technique will only report on the properties of protons in that molecule. And this is what a typical proton nuclear magnetic resonance spectrum looks like. You see on the x-axis we have this chemical shift in parts per million. This relates to the energy that is being absorbed by the sample. And we'll talk a little bit about how the technique actually works in the next few slides. But this energy or this chemical shift at which these peaks appear can tell us something in the end about the electron density near the nucleus and that will help us figure out the compound's identity. A little bit of vocabulary associated with this. People refer to the right hand side as up field and the left hand side as down field. We're going to be doing this experiment in a pretty strong magnetic field and the name nuclear magnetic resonance kind of suggests that. So we're talking about the magnetic field, up field or down field. Okay, so how do we have this spectrometric technique that explores only nuclei? Well, nuclei are charged. Specifically, they're positively charged. And charged particles do interact with magnetic fields. And in physics, you may have learned that magnetic fields are often indicated by the symbol beta sub naught with an arrow indicating the direction of the magnetic field. Now, a resonating nucleus generates a magnetic field of its own. And this generated magnetic field might be aligned in the same direction as indicated by these small arrows with these little spheres representing nuclei pointing the same way as the applied magnetic field from the instrument. Or they may be opposed pointing the opposite direction to that applied field. It takes more energy to oppose the applied field than to align with it. Which means that by aligning these nuclei either with or against the magnetic field we generate two different energy states for these nuclei. If you have a nucleus that is aligned with the magnetic field, you'll have to apply a very specific amount of energy to promote that nucleus to a state where you flipped its spin. And it is this absorption of energy to cause that flip that we're analyzing in a nuclear magnetic spectrum. Now let's think about sort of predictions we can make about how many signals we would see knowing that we're looking at a set of nuclei flipping in a magnetic field and somehow the energy at which you flip that nucleus has something to do with the electron density near that nucleus. If we look at compound A, we have two H's here, two H's here, and three H's here. Now if we were doing a chemical reaction and I asked you to replace one of these two H's with some other species, these are considered chemically equivalent. You would get two different isomers depending on if you made a chiral center by replacing one of these, but they're chemically equivalent. And 
in a nuclear magnetic resonance experiment, they are also called magnetically equivalent. They're both adjacent to a partial positively charged carbon. They're sort of in the same electronic environment. And these two then would have an absorption of energy in a nuclear magnetic resonance experiment at the same energy as one another. So they will give you one signal. Let's call that signal one. Likewise, these two H's are chemically equivalent. And they would give us signal two. The CH3 at the end represents another set of three magnetically equivalent protons, and that would give us a third signal. So one thing we need to be able to figure out in looking at a molecule structure is which H's are related by symmetry or chemically equivalent in some other way by being on the same carbon, for example. And we would expect to see three signals in the proton nuclear magnetic resonance spectrum for that compound. And you can apply this thought process to any nuclei. So if we were doing a carbon NMR spectrum, this carbon, this carbon, and this carbon are each unique from one another chemically and magnetically. We'd also see three signals in the carbon-13 NMR spectrum. Now if you look at compound B, this isopropyl chloride though, you see that there's symmetry in this molecule, which means that this CH3 and this CH3 are chemically and magnetically equivalent to each other. So all six of the H's on those two CH3 groups would give us one signal in the proton NMR spectrum. And then the H that's unique sort of sitting on that symmetry axis would give us a second signal. So we would see two peaks in the proton NMR spectrum. And if we think about carbon nuclei instead, well, we still have the symmetry. These two carbon atoms would give us one signal. And then the carbon atom sitting by itself, unique on the symmetry axis, would give us a second one. We would also have two signals in the carbon-13 NMR spectrum. Sometimes it's a little harder to see the symmetry in a molecule or the chemical equivalence of certain sets of protons. For example, in this T-butyl group, we have three CH3 groups, and they're not related by something that you can quickly visually see as a symmetry plane. But if you think about rotating around, if you hold the molecule here with your hand, let's say you're holding onto the molecule and spinning it, you can rotate the molecule so that these three CH3 groups can interconvert with one another. And that makes them chemically and magnetically equivalent as well. So all nine of these protons on these three methyl groups would collectively give you one signal in the proton NMR spectrum. What about the carbon NMR spectrum? Well, these three carbons are also equivalent to one another, so they would give us one signal. But you see there's another carbon here. It doesn't have any protons on it, so a proton NMR spectrometer would not detect that nucleus, but the carbon NMR would. So we'd see two signals in the carbon-13 NMR spectrum for this molecule. Compound D, you can see the symmetry. So all six of the H's are chemically and magnetically equivalent. We'll see one signal in the proton NMR spectrum. And we also have just the two carbons related to each other, one signal in the carbon-13 NMR spectrum. How about something like compound E? Well, this is a little bit harder to see. If we imagine an axis going straight into the screen here, and we were to rotate this 180 degrees like a pinwheel, we can see that this CH3 and this CH3 would reflect to one another. Or we can simply flip the molecule around 180 degrees and see that those two are the same. So these two are chemically and magnetically equivalent to each other. That would give us one signal for those two carbons or for the two sets of CH3s. Likewise, if we see these two H's, we can also rotate the molecule 180 degrees and interconvert those, so they would give us a second signal. So if we think about how many signals in the proton NMR, we see that there are the CH3's that give us one signal, the H's that give us another signal, two signals in the proton NMR spectrum for this molecule. Now if we look at carbons, we see these two carbons are the same as each other, and these two carbons are the same as each other. So we also have two signals in the carbon-13 NMR spectrum. Now a lot of these cases we see that we have the same number of signals in both the carbon and the proton, but remember it's not always the case. We found at least one case already where that wasn't the case. Here's another alkene which has symmetry. So these two H's are the same as each other, and these two sets of CH3's equivalent to each other as well. Two signals in the proton NMR spectrum. What about the carbon spectrum? Well, we have these carbons that are the same as each other, equivalent, I should say, and then these two equivalent to each other. So also two signals in the carbon-13. Now sometimes you can't just flip or rotate things around and interconvert 
different groups with one another. For example, we learned that if you had a cycloalkane, you have some groups that are cis to one another and some groups that are trans to one another. And if we look at this molecule, and maybe it's easier to visualize drawing out kind of like this. Let's draw a bromine here. Well, we have some H's on the molecule that are related by symmetry and which are cis to that bromine. So, okay, if these are beside the bromine on the same side of the ring, and they're related by symmetry. Those two H's are the same as one another. Then we have the H's pointed away from us into the screen, and they're trans to the bromine, right? The bromine's pointed towards us, the H's are pointed away. Those are opposite directions, and that is what we call trans on a cycloalkane. So these two H's are different from the H's coming towards us. So if we're keeping track over here, we have sort of the cis H's, let's call them. We have the trans H's, and then we have one unique hydrogen that sits on the same carbon as the bromine. Now, no other H to sit on the same carbon as the bromine, so we have sort of, I'll call that the bromine H. So we should have three signals, and I've written this down here. So three signals, if we're talking about protons. What if we're talking about carbons? Well, we have three carbons in the molecule, but if we erase the H's knowing that the carbon NMR spectrum We'll only analyze carbons, and we don't have to draw H's in a line bond structure. That makes it easy to see these two carbons are related by symmetry. And then, of course, the carbon with the bromine attached is unique. So we're going to see two signals in the carbon-13 NMR spectrum. So the examples on this page show you some of the ways that you can analyze molecules to figure out how many signals you would see in nuclear magnetic resonance spectrum. Now in the homework videos, the problem solving videos we have, after lessons 7.6 and 7.7, .7, you actually learn a lot more by doing actual examples and analyzing molecules and their spectra. So we'll save a lot of our instruction for problem solving real world experience. So now we have some idea of how we can figure out how many signals we'll get. Now I previously mentioned that the place along the x-axis, the energy, at which the nucleus absorbs has something to do with the electron density around that nucleus. Well, how does that work? Well, let's think about a nucleus, just a proton, in an electron-poor environment. So let's just not draw any electrons around that nucleus in this picture. We apply a magnetic field. Right? We have an energy difference between the two states, and that's the energy that proton will absorb that we see absorbed in the spectrum. So you will have to apply more energy to flip a nucleus that is exposed to a stronger magnetic field. Now very cleverly, the chemical shift is expressed as a part per million of the applied field. So the number along the x-axis will show up at the same position, right here's between three and four or right around one, no matter how strong that field is that you apply, because we're doing it as a parts per million of that field. But let's consider two nuclei in the same spectrometer, meaning they both have the exact same applied magnetic field from the instrument. And let's say that you have an electron right beside this proton. Maybe we have this electron in a bond or a lone pair. It won't matter. Well, this one over here in box A, this proton has no electrons around. It's our electron poor environment. Here's our electron rich environment. Well, the electron is negatively charged and it's going to generate a magnetic field as it spins in opposition to that of a positively charged particle in the same condition. Now what that means is that this little proton sitting here is experiencing a magnetic field going down from this electron and a magnetic field going up from the instrument. So overall what it's experiencing is this field minus this field. So it's actually experiencing a smaller field than over here where you see this is experiencing the full field of the instrument because there are no electrons around it. So the take home lesson of all of this is that more electron density shields a nucleus and lowers the energy needed to flip it. So in this way, the NMR chemical shift is an indirect way to measure electron density, which allows us to deduce the type of group containing the nucleus. You'll certainly have a different electron density for a hydrogen attached to an oxygen compared to a hydrogen attached to a CH3 group. So more electron density shields the nucleus, thus requiring less 
energy to flip that nucleus. So if I consider an alkyl group, there are no electronegative atoms pulling electrons away from the protons in that molecule. If I was to put a proton on the same carbon atom as an electronegative atom, like this, you know that these types of electronegative atoms will start to pull electron density away from the area near that proton. With fewer electrons around the nucleus, it requires more energy, higher chemical shift, to flip that nucleus. The other thing I want to point out are these numbers printed above the peaks. Now, these numbers aren't telling you the chemical shift, right? This says 9, and the chemical shift is 1. So what are these numbers trying to tell us? Well, these numbers are the integration, or the area under the peak. And the ratio of these integrations can be used to show us the ratio of protons giving us each signal. For example, this signal could be attributable to 9 H's that all exist in one chemically and magnetically equivalent group. Another group of chemically equivalent protons, maybe 2 H's, exist somewhere else in the molecule. So if we had 9 H's in a t-butyl group like we talked about when we are trying to figure out how many signals a molecule would give, and then a CH2 group here, and then some type of electronegative atom that caused this peak to appear at a different chemical shift than this alkyl peak, that type of analysis could start to show you how you can figure out what molecules look like just from the NMR spectrum. Now one warning, if you take a real NMR spectrum, there's no magic way the spectrometer knows the signal came from exactly nine atoms, nine nuclei, in your molecule. It prints a ratio. It might even print a fractional ratio. It might say 0 0.2 and 0 0.9. You just know that this one is 4.5 times as many nuclei giving you this signal as this signal. It may even say something like 4 and 18. Now you don't have 4 H's and 18 H's in the groups of chemically equivalent protons that give each signal. But again, the instrument has no magic way of knowing exactly how many atoms or nuclei are in your molecules. Now we talked about how the NMR technique works. We talked about the nucleus can be aligned with or against the applied external field. Then we talked about the fact that electrons near the nucleus would oppose the external magnetic field and therefore shield the nuclei but if you have these nuclei in a molecule, and their nuclear magnetic moments can be aligned with or against the applied field, they might start to influence one another if they're close to each other, right? Let's consider these two carbons. And these are protons on adjacent carbon atoms, and they're kind of close to each other, right? And let's say we're talking about nucleus A. The nucleus A is going to stay the same in both cases. Well, you have a 50% chance that the nucleus right beside it will happen to be pointed down, and a 50% chance that the H beside it, or nearby it, will be aligned up with the applied magnetic field. That creates two different energy states for this nucleus A. So instead of having one signal like this, like we saw in our previous spectra, that same signal is split into two peaks that are very close to one another. This is a particular peak shape called a doublet. Now you can probably envision that the protons in a typical organic molecule, even a pretty small organic molecule like this, are actually next to more than one other proton on the adjacent carbon. For example, these two H's are chemically equivalent, but they're sitting beside three protons just on that one carbon beside it. So as there are more and more protons on adjacent nuclei, the splitting gets more elaborate and you have a number of different energy states possible for a nucleus, and this leads to these different peak shapes. If you don't have any nuclei at all on a neighboring carbon, you have what is called a singlet, one single peak. No nuclei are nearby to split that signal or cause it to experience different energies, one peak. That tells you that the number of H's on the neighboring carbon would be zero. No protons on neighboring carbon. We just saw that if we have one nucleus on the adjacent carbon. Then it splits its neighboring nuclei signal into two. If I have two neighbors, you actually end up with three different energy states, and you get a peak shape called a triplet. If you have three, you get a quartet. If you have four H's on neighboring, you'd have a peak split into five. And as you build up more and more protons on adjacent carbons, you see the multiplicity, or the number of little peaks into which the signal is split, increase by one each time.
The general rule is that the multiplicity, or the number of energy states, the number of little peaks into which you split your signal, the multiplicity, m, is equal to the number of protons on neighboring carbons plus 1. And the ratio of the little peaks within that signal follow a pattern as well. Of course, if you only have one peak, it has, say, an intensity of 1. The doublet, you have two equally likely energy states, so the ratio is 1 to 1. And what you do to get these numbers for the more elaborate splitting patterns is you always start with a 1 on the outside of this triangle. This is called Pascal's triangle. And then you sum the two numbers right above to give the next value. So you add the 1 and 1 to get the 2. You add the 1 and the 2 to get the 3, etc. So eventually you're adding 10 plus 10 to get 20, for example. And that's why you have these particular shapes. And these numbers come from the probability for each of these energy states occurring for a particular signal. With these basics about nuclear magnetic resonance spectrometry in mind, we're going to explore in more detail proton and carbon NMR spectra specifically.